My name is Ken Mejia Beal, and I'm the chair of the Democratic Party of DuPage County. And thank you for joining us for another edition of Chair Chat. This evening, I am excited to have my friend, Senator Karina Villa, joining us this evening. Hello, Senator Villa. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Ken. How are you? Fantastic. I, I was sharing that um, I, I believe I did your first uh, volunteer training when you ran for a state rep. Um, and, and that it was actually during that training where I got to hear you talk to people and talk about your vision that I went from being someone that said, wow, I hope she wins to being someone that said, my God, I need to make sure that she wins. <laughs> Thank you so You're much. I remember that very clearly uh, over on uh, Route 59 at the, uh, the Legion Hall there. Yes. So it was uh, good times. It was awesome. Um, so I want to jump right in. And my first question for you is when you first ran, you ran a state rep. What pushed you to run for the state rep position? Well, thank you so much, Ken, for first of all, um, inviting me to participate tonight. Uh, it, you know, forums like this just help people learn more about running for office and hopefully will inspire someone out there listening to one day say, I'm gonna go ahead and run. So, um, you know, I remember years and years ago when I was a school social worker, I had the extreme pleasure of meeting then representative Linda Chapalavia. She came to West Chicago um, because the current state representative, Mike Fortner, invited her to come and speak to the students of West Chicago since the students were predominantly Latino and uh, Linda, of course, is Latina herself. So uh, she came and spoke to the students. Uh, I wasn't able to go to the assembly because I was dealing with a student crisis. But in between passing periods, the students came up to me and they were like, oh my gosh, Miss Villa, we really want you to meet this woman who spoke to us. We loved her, she's so awesome. And we think that she reminds us a lot of you. So we want you to go say hi to her. So I was like, okay, well, let me run down and say hello. And lo and behold, I meet Linda Chapalavia and she um, at that moment was like, you're awesome, like you're a school social worker, the kids love you, and you need to one day consider running for office. And I'm just like, oh. okay, but that to me was like so impossible to imagine. I was All I wanted to do was work with my students and uh, do the micro practice of social work. And so um, she was really the person who first planted the seed in my head and then years later, um, I would say it was about seven years or eight years later is when I decided to run for um, state representative. And Linda was actually the first person I went to go talk to about it. Um, and she showed me the ropes and was a great mentor. Wow, thank you. And I'm happy you ran. <laughs> and I'm sure there's lots of other people out there that are happy you ran also. Um, my second question for you, what are your thoughts on expanding mental health programs in our schools? So prior to running for state representative, I ran for local school board. So I was on the board of education in West Chicago District 33, uh, the same district in which I had worked, uh, had a career in for 10 years. So when I was on the school board, board, it was my priority to make sure that we had full-time schools in every building. The reason that was so important was because as a school social worker, I felt the need um, so strongly. There were times that um, I was assigned to three buildings for an academic school year. So if you can only imagine being a part-time social worker in three different buildings, um, it, it was a lot to keep up with. And the families needed more than that. The students needed more than that. Um, we as social workers aren't just in charge of individual education plans. We also deal with the day-to-day -day crisis that might come up. And quite frankly, Ken, there's just so many crises that are coming up right now for students and families. Um, so in terms of expanding um, mental health professionals within the schools, 
this isn't a new concept for me. It's one that I have championed since the time I was on the school board. And it is one that I have continued to champion. Um, I think that it's absolutely critical. Our students are living in a state of um, just in a state of emergency in terms of their social emotional needs and investment in mental health professionals for the schools is an investment that will pay back dividends tenfold down the line. Oh, thank you for that. And I 100% agree. Um, my next question for you is a kind of a double question. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to recognize that you've been very deliberate in your actions regarding preserving our small businesses here in Illinois. And I, I appreciate it. And I'm sure our small business owners appreciate it. So I want you to kind of explain why um, you, you are so deliberate with your intent with our small businesses. And second, what are some of the policies that you believe need to be put in place to protect our small businesses? So in terms of why small businesses are near and dear to my heart, um, my mother and father are small business owners. So when I was 13, my parents opened their first small business, which was a Mexican grocery store in West Chicago. Um, that was so many years ago, again, when I was only 13 years old. Um, I know it seems like it was just a few years ago, Ken, but it was. <laughs> it <wild>. was. <laughs> um, so, you know, the work, I used to go to the grocery store and work um, all of the time. I was there uh, every weekend. I was there after school, after sports. Um, I helped stock the shelves and I helped um, uh, ring up people at the cash register. Really the values that I learned in my parents' grocery store of hard work ethic, of family coming together to pitch in, but also about community, Ken. You know, our grocery store became a hub for people to come in and it was a trusted place where people would come and ask us to translate letters for them. Um, they would ask us about how to navigate different public systems, how to enroll their children in school. Um, it, it really was just this beautiful um, place for the community where they felt safe. They knew that if they came to our store, that they would have uh, they would have a friend. They would have someone that they could count on. There were times that families would come in and they didn't have money uh, enough to pay for grocery for their groceries, but they knew that you know they could ask um, our family and say can can we take some groceries and and come back and and pay it later of course that was always something that we did because people should not be hungry right, right. um and so where is my heart in regards to small businesses my heart is with my family my heart is with my community and i believe that small businesses are part of the american dream right um i i think that i as long as I remember, my parents would talk about, you know, we just want to open a little store. We want to, we want to open a little store. It would, it's our dream. And, and it was, it was a smaller grocery store with a meat market and it was beloved by many. So that's why, uh, to me, specifically during the pandemic, um, I worked so hard, my office and I worked so hard with the um, uh, Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity uh, and the Aurora Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. We worked closely with them to go to the small businesses and we knock on their doors and explain to them about all, all of these different um, grant opportunities that were available to them. We urged them, we begged them, we implored them to fill out these um, applications to get um, funding from the government, government because of 
the interruption to their businesses during COVID. We were able to, as, um, as a direct result of us going and knocking on these businesses, we brought $1.65 million in funding to our community. Um, places that we went and literally knocked on their doors and talked to the owners, uh, these places included uh, Monarca Gifts, Vanity Hair Salon, Los Girasoles, ta uh, Taqueria, uh, Nails de Angel, La Cocina de Maria, and El Coco Loco. These are some of the businesses that had a direct impact because of us uh, going and talking to them. Now, in terms of policy, Ken, I would say that um, finding ways, uh, as you heard in the governor's address, uh, some of some of these businesses are going to be seeing some relief in terms of, um, for example, for liquor licenses, uh, holding off for a year on those renewal fees. Um, you heard about the the state gas tax having a year um, break. That would that'll impact the business owners, the business owners that have to drive around and uh, you know go go and and do. Uh, the work that they have to do and th that'll help them save on their bottom bottom dollar. Um, I think that also making sure that there's money invested in opportunities like the small business development centers. Um, I don't know if you knew this, but um, our community colleges in the area, so Elgin Community College, College of DuPage, Wabonzi Community College, they all have small business development centers that hmm. in their uh, buildings to provide assistance and resources to small business owners. Um, we want to make sure that we keep funding uh, these programs like this because we know that to be a small business owner, it's really tough. And if they need resources, if they need guidance, we want them to have access to these small business development centers in order for them to um, thrive with their business models. Wow, thank you. And I did not know that information, so thank you for sharing it. Um, <clears throat> my next question, you serve on the mental and the behavior health committee. What can we look forward to seeing on the agenda in 2022? There's a lot of discussion right now in regards to mental health overall. There's a lot of conversation of bringing funding for some of these services. That is one of the biggest setbacks is uh, people with master's level degrees in social work are leaving the industry in terms of um, working for state agencies or just simply not working, not, not going there. They're going to private agencies instead. And part of that is because of the lack of reimbursement for the services. I mean, mm. some of these people um, have um, student loans for up through a master's degree. And so if you're getting offered a job making, you know, $40,000 versus maybe a starting position at $60,000, kind of a no-brainer um, where people are going to um, tend to lean to. So one of the things that we've been working on is making sure that we're finding ways to do tuition reimbursement for people who maybe go and work at these state agencies like DCFS, because we know that we need um, qualified uh, master's level social workers to come and take care of the most vulnerable people in our society. And those are the children who are within the DCFS system, not just the children, but the families as well, the parents who are in crisis and who are experiencing some of these stressors that are maybe uh, leading them to um, engage in, in, in behavior that they could maybe just need some assistance and, and they can then turn their, their behavior around. So um, I think, be on the lookout for uh, investments in in mental health. Also, um, right now, there's so many different state agencies that have pots of money that go towards mental health services. Um, and really not like a centralized location that keeps track of all of this 
the, the way that the money is spent or if a, if a family might need you know, services from two of the different agencies or three of the different agencies, there's really no linkage uh, amongst the agencies or communication between the agencies about the work that, that's going on. So uh, be on the lookout for a position that would be in charge of overseeing all of the great work that's happening within all of the different agencies. Also an important thing to note, and I know that it's a thing that it's in DuPage County, we wanna sweep it under, under the rug, we wanna pretend it doesn't exist, we wanna think that it's not a problem, but it is, and that is the overdose um, uh, issue yes. uh, with, with people who are suffering from drug addictions, uh, accidental overdoses. This is a real issue. It is here in DuPage County, it is not going away, we can't. Uh, you might want to sweep it under the rug, but it's going to be a big old lump in the middle of your living room um, and people are going to know that it's there. So we need to face these issues head on. We need to, uh, instead of running away from it, we need to look it right in the face and we need to find solutions for it. And, um, you know, it is something that I am extremely committed to um, trying to find ways to bring resources to um, to help people who are struggling in in this area. Thank you. And speaking of hitting uh, tackling issues head on, lately there has been a lot of attention, uh, rightfully so, placed on the safety of our social workers. Um, so, as a former social worker, what are your thoughts on safety in the realm of social work? So. You know, I, I was always of the opinion that it was important to meet a family where they were at. And I also was of the opinion that sometimes that wasn't in the school building. Sometimes that was at their home. Sometimes that was at the local Dunkin' Donuts. Some, sometimes it was outside of their place of work. I was this old school kind of social worker that uh, believed in a holistic approach, which included the community in which the client lived. You know, I still believe in that approach. I still believe that our social workers need to have access and availability to meet the client where they're at. Um, and sometimes, that means that, that the social worker can't go to the home. It sometimes means that the social worker has to find other ways of engaging. I think that social workers have a training that police officers don't. I think that police officers have told me that they want social workers, they want more social workers because they see, the police officers see the mental health needs that there are in the community. And they're just not trained as social workers. They're not trained to respond to some of these crises that they're encountering within the community. I think that in regards to safety, social workers need to have quick and ready access to information about homes that they're going to visit. If they, are, if they are mandated like by DCFS to go on these home visits, there needs to be timely access of information of whether or not it is a safe home to go to. And if it's not a safe home to go to, then they need to have assistance from the local police departments or they need to be using the buddy system, or they need to be interviewing the child somewhere outside of the home. I think that, you know, we, it, it, in, in all of my 15 years of being a school social worker, there's, there was one time, there was one time that I was deeply afraid. Mm -hmm deeply afraid, Ken. It was one time, and this was hundreds and hundreds of home visits that I had gone on 
And that time I had my school principal with me. I wow. didn't go by myself and we backtracked and got out of there and immediately sat down, reviewed what had happened, reviewed the situation, reviewed what we needed to have done better, what we should have done better, uh, red flags that we should have thought about, um, you know, to make sure that a mistake like that was never made again uh, on our behalf. So I really think that making sure that we're following best practice, uh, that we're reading all of the signs that we're that we have access to the training that we need in order to make the decisions of safe entry to, to homes um, and immediate access to, to information such as whether there's a criminal history in the home. Mm -hmm. uh, I think all of those things are, are important. Thank you. And I 100% agree. Um, and I really appreciate you sharing such a personal uh, thing with us, um, that personal story. Um, now, for our last question, I like to keep the last one light and fun. So this is a pivot. Um, I know typically the question is, if you could pick one song uh, to play every time you entered a room, what would it be? But I'm not going to ask you that. Senator Villa, if you could pick one song to play every time you exited a room, oh, man. <laughs> what would it be? <laughs> I Ken, you <laughs> the question. You're making me think on my toes. I'm so So Girl on Fire was my theme song during the campaign cycle when I ran for state rep. Um, that song still to me resonates. Like I, it still gets me fired up. It gets me motivated on my bad days. I play it. It, it keeps me going. I like to use, um, I, I like to use songs, you know, that'll help bring a message to others. I'm going to say that song. I'm still going to say it. Like when I walk out, I want I want people to think that. <laughs> I want to be like, she's on fire. She's going. She's going to get it done. So I love it. I'll still, I'll still have the same song. I'm going to say Girl on Fire. Okay. I, I love it. And Senator Via, where can people find out how they can help you, where they can donate, where we can knock doors? Where can they find that information out about you and your campaign? Sure. So um, you can find me on Facebook under Citizens for Karina Via. I'm also on Instagram. Um, you can find my website super easy, www.karinavia.com, K-A-R-I-N-A-V-I-L-L-A.com. Um, those are easy ways to access me or someone from my campaign. Well, thank you so much for joining us for a Friday night chat. Thank I you. look forward to seeing you. And I, I think I'm going to be knocking doors for you next weekend, um, next Saturday, I think. So I look forward to seeing you very soon. Sounds good. <laughs> I don't know if you'll be at the gala tomorrow. So if you are, then I'll see you there. I will see you at the gala and oh, wait no. until you see my jacket. <laughs> can't wait. We always take a selfie together at the gala. So can't wait to do that too. That's not changing. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you so Bye, much. Everyone. Good night.